thank you to Craig and the team for inviting me to be part of New Cardiovascular Horizons this year. It was due to be my first time attending in New Orleans and I'm disappointed to be missing out on that opportunity, but glad to be joining you virtually. So I'm going to present uh, on bioresorbable scaffolds used for below the knee applications. And particularly, I'm going to give you an update on the absorbed BTK study long term results. These are my disclosures. So for many years now, we've been using drug eluting stents below the knee uh, because we know they work. They're very effective at suppressing neo-intimal hyperplasia and providing mechanical scaffolding. But after they've been placed, they can act as a chronic irritant and create long term scaffold failure. Um, whereas a, a scaffold that dissolves, that bioresorbs, has potentially the best of both worlds attached to it, being able to provide that mechanical scaffolding, provide a drug delivery service directly to the site of the, the endothelial injury, and then slowly absorb over time, allowing the blood vessel to return to its normal functional status. This is the absorbed BVS and what it looks like on histology. It's made of a poly L lactic acid backbone with a poly D L lactic acid covering, which contains Everolimus in the same concentration as the Zients family of stents. You can see it here a month or so after implantation when the endothelial lining has come over the top of it. It's slowly broken down into smaller parcels, which were engulfed by macrophages and removed. And then over time, 24 to 36 months, it's completely removed and replaced by extracellular matrix and then uh, vascular smooth muscle cells in a restorative concept. Seven years ago now, we designed a study which was prospective, non-randomized and single center. It was designed to include patients with chronic lower limb ischemia, Rutherford categories three to six. We enrolled only patients with a reasonable life expectancy of at least a year. We were looking to treat single or multiple de novo lesions, which had to be at least 60% in severity. And although we were focused very much on infrapopliteal arteries, we did include the distal popliteal if it was continuous with disease in the TP trunk. We capped a lesion length at five centimeters to align with the length of two bioresorbable scaffolds that we had available to us at the time. And equally, we capped the diameters at 4.0 to, to match the size matrix of the device we were using. I'm going to show you results here uh, at up to five years, but in fact, we have followed these patients at regular intervals at one, three, six, and 12 months, then every 12 months ongoing, evaluating them clinically, determining their Rutherford class, and then using a very sensitive duplex ultrasound criteria of uh, peak systolic velocity ratio of 2.0 to determine binary restenosis, and through that, primary patency, our primary endpoint. Over the period, we treated 55 limbs in 48 patients. You can see it was a fairly elderly cohort, even one patient out to 97 years. So these are older patients. The vast majority of them had critical limb ischemia. You can see that 73%. We deployed 71 scaffolds in total. You see there was a smattering of use in all of the tibial arteries, but there was a particular predilection for their use in the proximal third of the calf and in particular, the tibioperineal trunk. It's worth noting also that the mean lesion length in our study was 20.1 millimeters. So these were short focal lesions. However, this was consistent with what we've seen in drug eluting stent trials of the past. Our results showed 100% procedural and technical success. We had 18 deaths in the cohort, which represented 38%. All of these were outside the 30 day window and all of them were unrelated to the procedure or the device. We know from the international literature that with predominantly CLI cohorts of patients, you lose approximately 40 to 60% through natural attrition after five years. So this is consistent with what we would have expected. We followed these patients for a mean follow up period of 35 months and we observed sustained clinical improvement in 95% of the cohort. See here the change in Rutherford class over time. Most of them ended up being Rutherford zero after treatment. We saw an assisted primary and secondary patency of 100% and a limb salvage rate of 100% as well. These were our earlier published results in Jack Cardiovascular Interventions. 
you can see that at one year we achieved a primary patency of 89.2% and a freedom from clinically driven TLR rate of 97.2%. At three years, we observed a primary patency of 80.3% and a freedom from CDTLR of 90.7%. And now at five years, we have observed a primary patency of 72.9% and freedom from CDTLR of 90.7%. And I think it's worth just pausing here for a moment to digest these results. This is a tibial artery trial, and we've never seen primary patencies in the 70s at five years for the tibial arteries, let alone freedom from CDTLR of just under 91%. So to put this into context with the international literature on drug-eluting stents, the only study to have followed drug-eluting stents out to five years is the PADI trial. You may recall that this was evaluating the Boston Scientific Taxa stent against PTA bare metal stent uh, control arm. Our 72.9% primary patency can be directly compared to their observed drug loading stent primary patency of 11.6% because we used very similar criteria to define patency using the same peak systolic velocity ratio of 2.0 with our duplex ultrasound. So in conclusion, what we've seen here is a first generation bioresorbable scaffold and we've observed excellent long-term patencies and freedom from TLR rates in tibial arteries. In my view, this acts as a proof of concept, which really facilitates the next generation of bioresorbable devices and a larger evaluation in the form of a multi-center randomized trial. So this leads me to announce the LIFE BTK trial. This is a pivotal investigation that's designed to evaluate a brand new bioresorbable vascular scaffold, the Esprit scaffold from Abbott Vascular. This is an RCT aiming to enroll 225 patients, both inside and outside the US, and randomize them two to one against plain balloon angioplasty. We're gonna look at six month primary endpoints, both at safety endpoint, which would consist of major adverse limb events and perioperative death, as well as an efficacy endpoint, which will be primary patency and limb salvage. And it will be under the trial stewardship of myself, Sahil Parikh and Brian Derubitus. This scaffold is different from Absorb. It is thinner, thinner struts, 99 microns in fact. It's thought to be made in longer lengths, although that has not been finalized yet. It's made of PLA lactic acid, just the same as Absorb with an Everolimus coating on its surface, but uh, has a 100 microgram per centimeter squared dose density, similar to the Zeitz family of stents. We're gonna be evaluating patients with critical limb ischemia, Rutherford Becker, class four to five, we're going to use the device in the proximal two thirds of the native infrapopliteal arteries, and we're going to have a maximum number of three scaffolds in any given target lesion, although you can treat up to two target lesions as part of the trial protocol. Each of the lesions could be up to 100 millimeters in length, and in total, we could be treating 170 millimeters of length lesions in a single leg. We're going to focus very much on the PSP concept to make sure our results are as good as they can be. So that's aggressive and adequate predilatation, intravascular assessment of vessel diameter, and then high pressure post dilatation using non-compliant balloons. With that, I'm going to sign off and thank you all for your attention.